Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, please welcome with me the speaker for this week's IBIS seminar, Dr. Lisette Waits. Despite starting a promising career in human genetics, Dr. Waits' passion for nature and fascination for large carnivores, especially brown bears in Yellowstone National Park, led her to change her research focus to wildlife and conservation genetics, where she has published over 220 papers. In a research field where high quality DNA samples are often difficult to obtain, from early on, Dr. Waits developed methods to reliably genotype individuals based on low quantity and low quality DNA. <clears throat> Her expertise in non-invasive sampling and genetic monitoring, as well as her enthusiasm for sharing and augmenting knowledge involves Dr. Waits in many different projects around the globe, not only as a supervisor of currently 10 graduate students, but also as a member of the IUCN Conservation Genetics Specialist Group. Internationally, she's affiliate faculty for Tropical Agricultural Research and Higher Education Center in Costa Rica, as well as the Universidad Técnica Particular de Loja in Ecuador. <clears throat> um, nationwide, she is the president of the National Association of University Fisheries and Wildlife Programs. And here at the U of I, she is a BCP faculty head of the Department of Fish and Wildlife and University Distinguished Professor. Despite these appointments, most of all, she's a researcher, keeping pace with the fast progressing development of new techniques and performing cutting edge research, further enhancing the monitoring and um, facilitating scientifically supported management of wildlife. So thank you, Lucas. And thanks everyone uh, for attending. It's great to see so many friends and students on the seminar today. And hopefully I can distract you from the election for the next 45 minutes or so. I'll start by sharing my screen. All right, let me make, get some things out of my way here. On my screen so I can keep track of things. Okay, so I've talked about a lot of different topics and seminars at the University of Idaho over time. And when I chose the topic for today, I decided I wanted to focus on my applied work um, in genetic monitoring, partially because it's been such a satisfying part of my career to be involved in the active management of a variety of endangered species, like the ones that you see here. Okay. And I'm talking about genetic monitoring today, and this is a, like a term that wasn't defined until 2007 by Mike Swartz, and then it was kind of refined in 2010 by Jeff Stetz. And in genetic monitoring, we've divided types of work that we do into, or the types of questions that we can answer into three different categories. The blue category is shown here evaluating demographic parameters of populations, the green category that you're all pretty familiar with, looking at population genetic parameters, and then finally category three, getting at evolutionary adaptation type questions. And genetic monitoring also indicates that we're taking multiple samples over time so that we're monitoring change in trend in these parameters. This slide from Stets, graph from that article, shows how there's been a large increase in the number of publications where genetic monitoring is used for wildlife populations. And I've worked on both plants and animals, but most of my work has been on wildlife, and that's what I'll focus on today. But you see this changing trend, and that leads to the question of why. Why have we seen this large increase? There are two answers. One, because geneticists are superheroes. And two, there's a lot of poop out there. And it was in 1992, back in the olden days when I was in graduate school, when someone first determined that you could get DNA from hair samples and fecal samples that wildlife had left behind. And this was done in Europe first with brown bears, like you see on this slide. 
and they were endangered, hard to track, and they started using hair and fecal samples to track them. And this work was also um, done in 1992 with hair samples from nest of chimpanzees. And the researcher that led this effort in Europe was Pierre Taberlet, and I had the opportunity to do my postdoc with him, which is where I started kind of developing interest and skills in this area. I'd also like to point out that the next generation sequencing people have chosen our acronym of chosen and stolen, our acronym of NGS, which has caused a variety of challenges of people getting confused between the two. After those first sources of DNA were identified, wildlife biologists have been creative and come up with a, a number of other things like saliva um, shown here and the other sources on the slide. This is urine on snow. Um, these are owl pellets, for example. And we have been using this diversity of sources of things that animals leave behind to track them and answer questions in genetic monitoring. So my lab has been involved with a lot of different genetic monitoring projects, but I wanted to highlight the six uh, projects here done on different endangered species. So the first long-term monitoring project that I started working on was with red wolves in North Carolina. I started working on it in 99, but we had genetic samples leading back to 87, and we're still tracking the red wolf population using genetic monitoring. I had the opportunity to work on the reintroduced Italian brown bear from 2002 to 2008. We've been working on northern Idaho ground squirrels since 2002, Idaho gray wolves and Mexican gray wolves um, since 2007, the Washington or Columbia Basin pygmy rabbit population since 2012 and with Sonoran pronghorn since 2013. Um, I don't have time to talk about all of these today, but I decided on Monday I was going to stay close to home and focus on Idaho gray wolves and the Columbia Basin pygmy rabbit uh, for the talk today. Now, these projects have been particularly rewarding, I think, as I mentioned at the beginning, because I've been directly involved with the recovery efforts. I've served on the recovery team uh, for the red wolf, the Mexican wolf, and the pygmy rabbit. And our results as they come in each year or each season are kind of immediately looked at by managers and used to make decisions for implementations on the ground to try to improve um, the status and of these endangered species. So the first case study I'd like to talk about is the genetic monitoring of gray wolves in Idaho. And this was a collaborative project between the Nez Pierce tribe, who was actually the collaborator with the federal government when gray wolves were reintroduced into Idaho. We also collaborated with Idaho Fish and Game and the Montana uh, Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Unit. So gray wolves were once present across all the areas in blue and orange that you can see here um, in North America, but they were extirpated due to hunting and trapping across their range. And they were had to be reintroduced into um, Arizona and New Mexico here in the south and then into Idaho and um, Yellowstone Park shown here in the north. And this map should now be updated because since the reintroductions, they've now spread into Washington, Oregon, and California. So it was in 1995 that the federal government started the effort to reintroduce gray wolves into Yellowstone Park and into central Idaho. And when they did this, the most critical form of management uh, tracking that they had was radio collaring those wolves and tracking them using telemetry. So this is really time consuming. It's really expensive. It's risky to the animal that you're capturing and to the people flying around in those planes and helicopters. So that led the managers to contact me and ask whether 
we could develop non-invasive genetic sampling methods for monitoring gray wolves in Idaho. And we started this as a pilot project in 2007, and it was part of the master's research of Jennifer Stingline. So I wanted to introduce some of the critical people for this. Jennifer, who I just mentioned, my master's student on the project, who did an amazing job getting this launched in the first few years, and David Osban, who you can see here on the right. He's been involved with the project from the beginning, first as an employee of the co-op unit, then as a PhD student at the University of Montana, then as an employee of Idaho Fish and Game, and most recently as a faculty member here in our Fish and Wildlife co-op unit. So he's been critical for the field implementation of this work and finding funding to keep it going for, for all this time. So I want to introduce the study area for our pilot project. So we're going to go to central Idaho and our study needed to monitor and track wolves across 11,000 square kilometers of central Idaho. And when we launched the pilot project, we chose different game management units, different spatial areas to focus on where there was good radio telemetry data on wolves. One of my big challenges as a researcher starting out here was just convincing wildlife managers that they could trust the results from genetic data. So much of our early work was done kind of in, in duplicate using traditional wildlife field methods and then genetic methods at the same time to test the reliability and the cost effectiveness of genetic methods compared to traditional methods. And in this case, we wanted to see if the methods worked well when wolves were at higher densities as well as when wolves were at lower densities. And for this pilot project, we had these research questions kind of starting at the individual scale of did this sample, this hair sample or this fecal sample, did it come from a wolf? Because we have coyotes running around out there that it might have come from, for example. And then which wolf? We need to be able to identify individuals um, for this to be successful. We also know we have wolf packs on the landscape and they're actually the kind of unit of management. So we wanted to know our ability to detect wolf packs that we knew were present in these areas and our ability to get accurate pack counts. At the study area scale, we wanted to obtain a minimum count of wolves and a population estimate of wolves and be able to see if we could distinguish between low and high densities. So to do this, we have 11,000 square kilometers to cover and we need an efficient sampling strategy to get those genetic samples. So thought about the natural history of wolves and also the fact that, as I mentioned, the breeding pairs and packs are the unit of management um, from a listing and delisting perspective for this endangered species. Um, and, and from a biological perspective, they're really important to track. So we want to sample reproductive packs. And when we think about reproduction, we have the pups being produced, they spend time in a natal den, and then these pups stay at a series of rendezvous sites where the adults take care of them, some of them do, and the other adults go out and hunt and bring back food for the other wolves. And then later, once the pups get older, they just travel with the pack. So we focused in on this period of time when wolves are localized at rendezvous sites. And because wolves did have radio collars for a number of years, they were able to determine and localize a variety of different rendezvous sites on the landscape. So we had data uh, for about 10 years from 1996 to 2006 of locations that wolves were using for rendezvous sites. So we used that data um, and did habitat modeling to develop a model that would predict where rendezvous sites would be. And so the best models included green leaf biomass, surface roughness, 
and the curvature of the landscape. And ultimately, these rendezvous sites in general, if we were to just describe them verbally, you would expect them to be in wet meadows. So the darker areas on here are those predicted rendezvous sites that we need to check and we need to evaluate whether we can find genetic samples in those areas. And we did a lot of walking. Um, we visited um, over 400, close to 500 sites in 2007 and 2008 across this landscape of our study area. And to give you an idea of what that looks like, here's one of those wet meadow rendezvous sites. This is kind of incredible field work. You get to stomp around the most beautiful places of Idaho. And you walk to the edge of a predicted rendezvous site, you howl for wolves, wait to see if you get a response, and then you start to search for sign to evaluate whether there are wolf tracks in the area. And of course, hopefully we're finding fecal samples that we can get DNA from. And we also looked for daybeds where we could collect hair samples uh, from those daybeds. And this is what we wanted and what we had in the end, a lot of coin envelopes uh, with genetic samples in them. And we would take them to the laboratory. We had to establish a special lab for low quality uh, DNA samples and develop techniques using mitochondrial DNA to differentiate species. We use microsatellite loci to detect and um, individuals and to get a DNA fingerprint representing a unique individual that we can recapture on the landscape and generate genotypes. We match them using different softwares. And then of course, um, really important that you um, have accurate genotypes so you can get accurate population estimates. And Craig Miller, I don't know if he's on today, but Craig was also important in developing one of the softwares that we use for population estimates. And he developed this specifically for non-invasive genetic sampling type sources of data. And it's a closed single capture model, single, single session model. It's a maximum likelihood model that we used, um, which had two possible capture rates. And in terms of recapturing, we set rules that we could recapture a sample uh, between locations or between types, hair versus scat, for example. And I see a question of do wolf packs ever reuse rendezvous sites from year to year? Yes, they do reuse rendezvous sites, um, and, but they do also move around the landscape to maybe more than one rendezvous site within a year. Oops, let's see, there we go. So moving on to our results of this pilot testing of this genetic monitoring technique. So first, um, our first summer was really a pilot season to find out, um, could we collect the samples? Are they working in the lab? Are they giving high enough success rates to, to make this a feasible method? Things went well in 2007, so we really ramped up our sampling in 2008. And you can see we had close to 1,500 samples in, in 2008. And 25% of the predicted rendezvous sites actually provided wolf samples. So for our first question, did the sample come from a wolf? Our success rates were approximately 85%. 80, um, in that you know, we had a pretty high success rate of getting DNA from those fecal samples and those hair samples. And all of our hair samples were wolf. While 15% of those fecal samples were coyotes. Now the hair samples were collected only at the rendezvous site. But for the fecal samples, we chose to also pick up what we called incidental scats, things we just found when walking from one rendezvous site to another, or when walking from our trucks to the closest rendezvous site. Um, and some of those were coyotes, but it seems like coyotes are smart enough to stay away from rendezvous sites in general, which is why we didn't find evidence of them um, in the hair samples. 
In terms of the question of identifying individual wolves, in our pilot season in 2007, about half of the samples we collected were successfully genotyped to individual. And those 123 samples represented 59 wolves. Some were captured a single time, some up to nine times in that season. When we moved into 2008, we ended up with um, 296 samples that were successfully genotyped which represented 98 wolves, 35 recaptured from the year before, and some detected um, up to 45 times. We actually analyzed more samples than we thought we would need because we wanted to model a, a subsampling protocol for future years. And we found that in terms of answering the questions about being able to detect differences in density across the landscape, once we got to the minimum count of wolves, we were able to accurately detect density, but we couldn't do it just from our mitochondrial DNA results of identifying, yes, it is a wolf. We needed to get all the way to the individual ID and a minimum count to detect differences in density. So I mentioned, you know, we had animals on the landscape to allow us to test our method and what was our probability of detecting a wolf if it was present. And for both years, if we look at individual wolves, about 62-63% of the time we detected it if we knew it was alive. And packs about well, higher, a little higher, 70-75% of the time we detected them. And in general, if we didn't detect them, it was because they were on private land, since we knew from the radio colors where they were, and they were in areas where we didn't have permission to sample. So overall, we had really good results with our detection probabilities. So the another question was, can we get accurate estimates of wolf pack size? So, Focusing in here on Moyer Basin uh, telemetry, where they had localized wolves and then they visually observed them. They counted nine adults and five pups. And with genetics, we counted the same number. Um, another pack that was a little more interesting to look at is here in Bear Valley, where um, with telemetry, they, they came to the conclusion there were a lot of wolves out there. There were 8 to 12 um, adults, but it was hard to keep track of how many total. And they knew there were at least three pups. And with non-invasive genetic sampling, we were able to say, well, actually there are 13 adults and five um, pups. And we distinguish adults and pups by the diameter of the fecal sample. So other things you can learn because you have this genetic tag, this unique identifier on an individual wolf, is you can learn about their movement and dispersal in the landscape, which is another important question, you know, from an ecological perspective, also from a gene flow perspective of kind of how much they're moving. And we had an example of a wolf that they had on radio collar down here in Soldier Mountain and we had a genetic sample from it and they lost track of it. They didn't know where it was, but we picked it up in our genetic sampling up here in Bear Valley, 50 kilometers away. So this is just one example of an additional type of question we can answer with this type of data. And getting an accurate population estimate was a really important question. Here you can see our point estimates and our 95% confidence intervals across the two years. Um, and we were able to compare that to the telemetry estimate, which is based on the number of wolves in each pack in the study area, so observational data. And then they estimated that they missed 9% of lone wolves that aren't radio colored, aren't traveling with a pack. And so our estimates were very close to the telemetry estimate. And um, in my opinion, I was happy to see they weren't an overestimate compared to telemetry because some early papers in wildlife genetics showed that if you have errors in your data set, 
you can get an inflated population estimate. But the estimates from telemetry and from our genetics are very similar and kind of within the 95% confidence interval. So now I want to introduce uh, Krista Stansbury, who um, was the next master's student to work on this project. And this is something my students and I do a lot of, walk around looking for poop. And I also wanted to highlight the fact that, you know, wolf management is always interesting and exciting and controversial. And these wolves were actually delisted in 2008, but due to legal reasons, relisted in 2009, delisted again in 2011, and they've been delisted ever since. And you probably recently saw in the news, gray wolves have been delisted across the, the lower 48 states now. But I wanted to highlight the fact that harvest started in 2009. It didn't happen in 2010, but it has happened since 2011. And that gives us another source of samples for genetic monitoring. And I'll kind of come back to that later in this presentation. But I wanted to mention after that pilot season, you know, we were happy with the performance of the method, but we also wanted to know if it would perform well if moving into central and sorry, moving into northern Idaho panhandle where the habitat's different. So our rendezvous site models might not work as well and it's wetter. So we actually expect a lower success rate um, with our non-invasive genetic sampling methods. We also made the decision over time that we could move to just sampling fecal samples and not spend all that time digging around in the grass looking for hair samples that we could still get good population estimates with just the fecal samples. And this is just work that we published in 2014 showing when we had comparisons to, um, again, some generally reasonably well-known population sizes for wolves in these areas moving into the north, we were still able to get genetic estimates that were close to um, the, the believed to be true estimates. And then some of our genetic estimates didn't work well, which are these up here, which we didn't use in the future. And the wolf movement and dispersal that I'm, we mentioned in the pilot project that you could detect now that we've moved to a statewide scale, that allowed us to detect movements of wolves on larger scales. So this figure here shows how we learned about wolves moving from the north and the arrow shows where they went to the east you know, from basically across this, this whole spatial scale and allowed us to kind of estimate uh, migration rates. We can also do parentage analyses, which allows us, you know, to estimate gene flow um, after movement, for example. And um, we've done a variety of studies looking at reconstructing pedigrees so we can understand wolf mating systems. And this is just one example of an interesting and complicated pack where a male bred more than one female in a single season. Um, it's not unusual for kind of across time for males to breed different females, but in this system, we actually documented a male breeding with multiple females. You know, we use these studies to look at the rate of inbreeding, um, which we occasionally documented, but it was relatively rare here compared to red wolves where we see it happening more often. As I mentioned, the um, addition of harvest and having a data set where wolves were not harvested for a number of years after reintroduction and they started being harvested um, around 2009 provided a lot of opportunities to understand the impacts of harvest on ecological and genetic parameters. And I don't have time you know, to go over these topics and results today, but I just wanted to kind of give you a feel for what you can do with such a, a long-term data set. But I wanna talk about one last way in which we use those harvest samples and um, to reconstruct 
um, gray wolf sibling groups and kind of why we wanted to do that. that. This work was published this year in the journal Wildlife Management led by Heather Clendenin, a master's student working in the BCV program with Paul Hohenlow and me. And then you can see the other co-authors on here. So I wanted to show you Heather and acknowledge her great work on this. And the other person I wanna acknowledge is Jim Hayden, the wildlife biologist with Idaho Fish and Game that we worked with, because the idea of using genetics in this way came from him. And it's to me a really good example of just how much my research program has benefited over time from collaborating with wildlife managers, working directly with them on um, study design, making decisions, because Jim wanted to know, since the Idaho Fish and Game is collecting genetic samples from all wolves that are harvested, um, and they're taking a tooth from every wolf to look at their age, he knew that he had a group of harvested pups, and we called them young of the year. And given, as I mentioned before, that the number of breeding pairs is this critical parameter for wolf managers, could we take those young of the year and use genetics to lump them into different sibling groups? And then that allows us to estimate, at least from the harvested wolves, what were the minimum number of breeding packs that we knew were alive in the summer producing wolves and were impacted by the harvest. So that was what we wanted to evaluate. Again, new pilot study, can we use genetics to answer these types of questions from, in this case, opportunistically collected, not non-invasively collected, but opportunistically collected genetic samples. So we had a data set from 2014 with 121 young of the year and 27 where we knew their sibling group. And in 2015, 162 young of the year, 61 where we knew their group. Again, giving us this ability to test the accuracy of our methods. We had 18 microsatellite loci for this analysis. Um, we also went on to test these methods with SNPs and for gray wolves, um, we had very good results with microsatellite loci and we didn't need SNPs, but for red wolves that have um, lower diversity, moving on to a, a different marker type was helpful. But with this pilot study with 18 microsatellite loci, we had a data set with background data. And in our case, that was allele frequencies from this many, many years of genetic monitoring. But we also knew that some managers might want to apply this method with no background data. And they would just use those um, harvested young of the year that they genotyped to infer the allele frequencies. So we tried it both ways. And we also evaluated you know, whether you could get by with fewer loci and kind of less money. But we assumed in order for that to work, you probably did need that background data on allele frequencies from a larger portion of the population. So that's what we tested. And we used Colony 2 um, to do the SIBSHIP analysis and to use statistical approaches to group them into uh, sibling groups. And as I mentioned before, um, we also had an independent estimate of the number of sibling groups um, from Idaho Fish and Game, as well as these embedded knowns. So in terms of the results, I'll say that all of our known sibling groups were accurately identified. And these are our results for the estimates of the number of litters with our different treatments. So we have very good estimates with or without background data. They didn't differ much um, within a year, but we had lower estimates in the number of sibling groups because we had less power to distinguish some groups um, with fewer loci. And our estimates using genetic data were very close um, to what Idaho Fish and Game believed were the number of breeding groups on the landscape that season. So to kind of tie up this case study, we demonstrated with all of this pilot work 
you know, that we can track individual wolves and dispersal. In fact, as wolves have moved um, from Idaho to Oregon, to Washington, to California, our lab has been the one who has the genetic database of the, that, those wolves. And people can send us fecal samples to find out, is it a wolf and where did it come from? And often we can track it back to packs we were working on with Oregon Fish and Game that moved to California, for example. We're able to determine occupancy and range expansion for this endangered species. We can determine the number of packs, the size of those packs, the, the structure um, and mating system and turnover change within those packs. We can estimate population size and density. We have estimated and evaluated genetic structure and gene flow, which I didn't show you, um, and also determine a minimum count of breeding pairs. So I'm gonna move on now to the Washington Pygmy Rabbit case study. And this has been done in collaboration with and funded by Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And Steph DeMay was the first PhD student working on this project. And Stacy Nurkowski is the current PhD student working on this project. They are both amazing students. So I have kind of a lot of amazing results uh, to share with you. Also have other important collaborators to introduce. Lisa Shipley from Washington State University, who is really important in the captive breeding efforts, um, as well as studying them in the wild. Janet Racklow, really important um, collaborator for studying them in the wild. And then Paul Hohenlow um, has been co-advising Stacy Nurkowski with me on this project. So to tell you a little bit about pygmy rabbits, they are the smallest rabbits in North America. And they're sagebrush obligates. In fact, in the winter, about 99% of their diet is sagebrush. They dig burrows for temperature regulation and for protection. Um, so that makes them an ecosystem engineer. Not all rabbits do dig their own burrows, but pygmy rabbits are unique in that way. Also, everything likes to eat them. Uh, so they do have very high and, and variable mortality and a short life. The historic range of pygmy rabbits kind of mimics the, a lot of the historic range of sagebrush shown here. And the Washington population, as you can see, is disjunct. Um, and it's been isolated for at least 10,000 years, though pygmy rabbits are thought to have been present in Washington for around 100,000 years. Stacy will also tell you this has been, the species has been scientifically proven to be cute. Pygmy rabbits in Washington, their populations uh, crashed around the 90s. And this dashed line shows where the population was and the red dot was kind of where it shrank to at the time of kind of crisis for the species. The causes of decline are habitat loss and fragmentation, primarily because of conversion to agriculture. They were listed as endangered in the state in 93, an emergency listed federally in 2003 as a distinct population segment. So they were only listed in Washington, but not in the other parts of the range. So in terms of recovery of this species, by the time they were emergency listed, there were very few left in the wild. So they made the decision to do captive breeding, which was led by Washington State University and Oregon Zoo, and that started in 2002. But surprisingly for rabbits, they didn't reproduce well. So, and they had measured genetic variation and were concerned that um, inbreeding depression was part of the problem. So they brought in some rabbits from Idaho for a genetic rescue and interbred Idaho rabbits with the Washington rabbits in 2003. And Captive breeding in the zoos was important in the early stage, but for successful reintroductions, it's really important to have on-site breeding enclosures. So they're reared in their native habitat. So the recovery program began that effort in 2012. And here's a kind of a map of the sagebrush, picture of the sagebrush habitat on the left. And this is Sagebrush Flat, the last place they were removed from 
and we're remaining in the landscape and see this darker color here is the sagebrush habitat. You can see the kind of the segments of agriculture all around. And we have these um, three areas where breeding enclosures were placed and they are also our three reintroduction areas, though the reintroduction efforts started in sagebrush flat. So the breeding enclosures look like this. There's a big fence to keep out terrestrial predators. There's some netting above the sagebrush to protect them from aerial predators and some food and uh, water were provided, though they were also eating, you know, the native sagebrush in these enclosures. They worked really well in the sense that the rabbits bred very effectively uh, within these breeding enclosures and they mostly kept the predators out. When they kind of launched these breeding enclosures, there really weren't enough rabbits in the zoos um, to get to a large enough population quickly enough to start release into the wild. So they made the decision to bring in rabbits from other states to interbreed with this now Washington, Idaho crossed rabbit. And they brought in rabbits from Nevada, Oregon, Utah, and Wyoming. And in 2012, uh, they started the reintroduction. And of course, monitoring is critical for reintroductions. And I was involved with graduate students at that time. And we started by comparing um, traditional monitoring with telemetry to genetic monitoring. We quickly came to the conclusion that genetic monitoring was going to be the most uh, cost effective and provide the most information. Um, so, we um, started that genetic monitoring first here in Sagebrush Flat and then later in these other areas as the reintroductions expanded. In terms of our genetic monitoring, we used a mitochondrial DNA test for species ID, particularly to distinguish them from cottontails um, when we were working with fecal pellets. And we did individual ID with approximately 10 microsatellite loci. But in order to answer all of our monitoring questions, we used 19 microsatellite loci and one um, locus that helped us distinguish sex. We had reference samples from all captive and captured rabbits and everything released into the wild. We took a genetic sample from. And then we did winter monitoring with fecal DNA. So we monitored a lot of different things in these introductions and have published multiple papers on, on what we learned. Um, we monitored survival, dispersal distance, mating system, genetic diversity, um, ancestry. How much of that Columbia Basin ancestry were we retaining and population size, growth and reproduction. So we took our genetic samples before releasing them into the wild. And I mentioned we did winter surveys to get the fecal pellets where we walk transects looking for tracks. Very exciting when you see something like this and you follow your rabbit tracks and you hope to find a burrow. We did it on snow because of two things. One, it's easy to find the tracks. And then of course the active burrows where they've been digging out dirt are easy to see. And then also that snow freezes the DNA. So those are the reasons for choosing winter monitoring. And actually University of Idaho classes have been critical in this monitoring. We take about 20 students out per year to help us collect these samples. Moving on to the results. So in our first breeding season is the first season we released into the wild. We start our monitoring in the winter, usually around December if we get snow. So the first breeding season is kind of December 2012 and then moving into 2013 uh, for January, February monitoring. The picture at the right can, shows you sagebrush flat is the outline. And then this light blue is the area where we physically put the rabbits and then all, everything in yellow is a rabbit that we detected in the winter. It had been released in, in the summer we saw it, or the fall and we knew 
um, its genotype. So we detected where it was on the landscape and we detected wild-born individuals where we didn't have a genotype from a released rabbit and also looked for the parents. So in 2012, we detected 45 individuals, which was approximately 40% of what was released, and we were happy to detect four wild-born. We also track active burrows because this gives us an indication of the number of rabbits on the landscape. We released more kits in 2013, and we detected 13% of those, and seven of those were wild-born. Um, in yellow are the ones released in 2012, so not very many survived two years. The ones in blue are the ones that were most recently released. In 2014, a lot of rabbits were released on the landscape. You can see a lot of different locations. Many were detected um, in 2014, but not as many wild born. And in 2015, I want you to see this spatial shift. They were all over Sagebrush Flat, and then now we're only finding them over here in some conservation reserve lands. And our success rates vary a lot over time, depending on weather. If it's less cold, more wet, we're seeing lower success rates. And here I've kind of changed the scale so you can again see how rabbits are expanding into other spatial areas and not as many on sagebrush flat. So to look at like the full data set um, over time through last winter is shown here. And you can see that um, we stopped releasing in 2017, so we didn't have enough healthy captive rabbits to release um, starting in 2017, but also we were doing great with the reproduction in the wild at that time. We were detecting large numbers of wild-born rabbits, um, but this past year we had just a disaster in that we only detected eight individuals and, and five wild-born. Um, and we have different hypotheses about what happened, which I can talk about in the question answer period, since I see I'm going long on my talk here. But this all focused on sagebrush flat. We've also reintroduced into Beasley Hills and into Chester Butte um, starting in 2017 and 2018, and we've monitored that. Um, but unfortunately in Beasley Hills, we lost our captive breeding area and our reintroduction site um, due to fire in 2017. But some of the habitat remained and we were able to track in 2018 um, that we did still have rabbits in the Beasley Hills area. And tracking in Chester Butte in 2018 we were seeing kind of good success and rabbits getting um, established there. Last winter, we had really large increase um, in the distribution and, and the number of rabbits in Chester Butte, which we were really excited about. But unfortunately, um, the fires you've heard about took out all of the rabbits um, in the captive and the wild population in Chester Butte. So to close out, I just want to hit on a few other um, interesting things we've learned from this genetic monitoring. We've tracked ancestry in the wild, which is really important. This was listed as a distinct population segment with the idea that it had perhaps unique adaptations, but we've been mixing Columbia Basin rabbits, the Washington rabbits with rabbits from other regions. So we have been tracking whether we're retaining that Columbia Basin ancestry in the population, which we have been, um, as you can see here. We've also tracked dispersal distances for juveniles and adults, which is really important ecological data, um, seeing that juveniles disperse larger distances than adults, but we are not detecting any significant differences between the sexes. We also, for animals in the enclosures, have an um, evaluated mating system hypotheses. We hypothesized that 
As densities got higher in breeding enclosures, that would decrease reproductive output. We also hypothesized with lower levels of genetic diversity, we would see lower reproductive output. We also thought that Washington ancestry could influence reproductive output. More Washington ancestry might lead to lower reproductive output if the bottlenecks had led to a loss of diversity and important um, adaptation. Al alternatively, they were locally adapted, so perhaps we would see increased fitness and reproductive output from Washington rabbits. In terms of these hypotheses, we found support for if you get too many rabbits in a breeding enclosure, you're going to decrease the reproductive output for rabbit. Also, genetic diversity did influence reproductive output, and Washington ancestry led more Washington ancestry led to higher reproductive output. In fact, males reproduced at 1.6 times higher rate. And we saw that females from Oregon and Nevada with higher ancestry from Oregon and Nevada um, had lower reproductive output, perhaps indicating outbreeding depression. Sorry, I'm going a little long, I'm almost done. Um, in terms of survival, we evaluated what factors might be influencing survival of released rabbits. And we found that the year we released them, kind of thinking about those environmental conditions, when they released and kind of how heavy they were mattered, and genetic diversity, um, higher heterozygosity led to higher survival rates. But ancestry for this data set did not influence survival. We've been monitoring diversity and ancestry in the captive population. And in terms of kind of where we are right now and our next steps, so as you've seen, genetic monitoring has been a critical component of this recovery effort. We know that genetic diversity and ancestry are affecting fitness. Um, we're transitioning to using SNPs in this system. We've identified 12,000 SNPs, currently working on a GT-seq panel so we can do the monitoring of fecal samples and, and any other samples collected kind of rapidly. And we're doing habitat analyses to try to understand all these changes of movement in the landscape, why they're using different habitats, for example. Um, and I wanted to highlight that you can hear all about the parts of the new work that I haven't talked about uh, when Stacy Nurkowski defends um, in February. So we had lots of people supporting financially the genetic work for both species. I want to thank my lab group. It's always a source of inspiration and um, stop and answer questions. I will stop sharing the screen so I can see people better. Okay. May I ask a question? Of course. Uh, so could you talk a little bit about politics versus science in these kinds of recovery areas? You didn't really talk very much about politics. You alluded to it, but. Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, it's been really different with every project that I've worked on. Um, but I guess I can say from my experience of working on the ground directly with the managers, I've been kind of well-funded to answer the questions that they're interested in answering. And they are using that data, um, I have felt, you know, to make good decisions to move um, those recovery efforts forward. Um, I've had to be like careful about what I present or where I present sometimes. Um, and the biggest disappointment I've had is with the Red Wolf program. Um, because due to politics, they stopped implementing all the good work that we were doing as a recovery team um, for that species. And they stopped kind of all the work we were doing to detect hybridization, the work they were doing to sterilize coyotes to prevent hybridization, and they just started letting local people shoot them. 
Um, and so in that, and then, you know, there was a lot of political debate about whether the red wolf was even a species and the National Academy of Sciences looked into that and said that they were, but, um, but still the US Fish and Wildlife Service is lagging behind. And I spend time talking to lawyers, giving them a scientist perspective on what's happening. Sometimes I do depositions on law cases. So I've been involved in the legal side, the politics, the science, but in general, I would say, I'm like, I have felt like the, the science has been used and respected with the exception of the later years of the Red Wolf program when people higher up in the government um, decided not to support that effort. Thanks. Okay. I've got a lot in the chat box here. Um, all right, were you able to identify wolf packs from the genetic sampling or did that come more from the radio collars? No, we did that from the genetic sampling um, and we did it, I didn't talk through the methods, but one way that we identified wolf packs is looking at pairwise relatedness among individuals and also looking at spatial location. Um, so if we sampled animals at a rendezvous site, um, we would hypothesize they're part of the pack and, and um, then we can run those relatedness analyses and parentage analyses to kind of reconstruct the parents um, and the offspring in that system. But so we've done it on that small scale, but we've also done it kind of on, on the larger scale that I showed you by my second master's student um, where we used a variety of parentage and pairwise relatedness analyses to take an entire data set and determine the number of wolf packs and determine the number of wolf dispersers between packs. Um, so yeah, we can do that. Um, and our, you know, all the cross-checking we've done suggests it's, it's very accurate compared to traditional methods with, with radio collars.